Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Bless the Talib. Okay, ready? Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melecha Ol, Asher Kashan, Bisma, Bisavano, Itate, Ba, Tzitzi. Sing the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Malchuto. Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. 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 All right. Let's say the Abinu prayer. We say it in Hebrew, since this is a Hebrew class. Ready? <coughs> Avinu Shabbat Shemaim Yid Kodesh Shimka Vayit Barek Malkutka Retzoneka Iehe Asui Bashemaim Uva Aretz Vatitain Bachmenu Temidit Umkolanu Gato Tenu Kaashir Anaknu Mokalim Lacho Tim Lanu Veal Tevi Enu Lidei Nisayam Basham Renu Mikara Amen. 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 Well, today, let's get into our lesson. Get it all set up here. There's our logo that don't believe that there's a God, that don't believe that there's a creation, that don't believe that things started by speaking out. They believe in the evolution, but where did evolution start? Everything's got a starting point except one, God. He never had a starting point. He always was. <laughs> he always is, and he always will be. So figure that out. You know, I always say there's one thing that you can never answer. What time, movie star, did you go to sleep last night? You cannot answer that. I know the time that was there. That's not the that question. That's not what you're answering. You're answering what time did I go to sleep? That's right. Nobody knows. I don't know. You see, even the person that'd be watching you getting in bed, they can't tell you when you fell asleep either because nothing changes when you close your eyes and you lay down and you relax. You don't know when you go slipping into that what we call sleep.
there's a factor that's got to be involved, you have to be ready to accept sleep. Now, why am I in sleep? When we are in the need for God's presence, he is always, always there. When the righteous call on God, he is there. He will answer us. What a comfort. I was reading in some scripture this morning because I'm really concerned about our election coming up. I really am. To a point where I'm anxiety stricken if I allow myself to, to reach that point. And God showed me, I think it's in Proverbs 8, 15. Some of you may want to check that out. Where it says, that God puts in the kings yeah. and takes them out. I think that's the right scripture. Mm -hmm. And you know that gave me peace. I'll do my voting, but it's God that's going to put the person in that he wants. Mm -hmm. I want to know the scary part. Yeah. If our nation is in a spot where our Creator deems it necessary to put us under uncomfortable situations, mm -hmm. He will put that person in place. Mm -hmm. Just like He has done in the past. Yeah. A little story about Nebi Baby. I call him Nebi Baby, but Nebuchadnezzar. Israel sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned. And look what happened. You know, watch what you pray for. Hezekiah was told that he was going to kick the bucket. Hezekiah cried to the Lord. He said, please, Allow me more time to live. He pleaded with God. This is a lesson in this here. God granted him 15 additional years, if we remember our scripture. Look what happened in that 15 years. Manasseh was born. Manasseh ruled Judah for 55 or so years. He was the worst king Judah had ever had. If God would not have answered Hezekiah's prayer, <coughs> we would have never had a Manasseh. I want you to think about that for a minute. When we ask God and he grants us the mercy we are literally saying to God, God, I really don't trust you. I, I, I want this, this, and this. But God knows it's not good for you. So he will allow sometimes to answer your prayer where it should not have been answered in the spiritual realm. So he answers it in the fleshly realm, and we suffer the consequences. And as we look back, we say, oh, if only... So I guess why I'm saying all this, let God be God. <laughs> he knows the beginning and the end of our lives. If we are faithful and just, if we have his peace, his shalom in our love, in our hearts, life would be so much simpler. Because the flesh is always reaching out for something that we think we want. But God supplies our needs, does he not? And out of his mercy and grace, he gives us our wants. Sometimes it's not good for us. That's right. But we want it anyway. We want it anyway.
girl wants to get married really, really badly. Begs her parents, please, please, please let me marry this man. Let me marry this man. And the parents know better. No, this man is not good for you. Well, how do you know? Because I know. I feel it. Because I've been there. I don't want you marrying. But, 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 and they run out and they get married. And a woman's life is nearly ruined because of the bad association. A lot of times, right after the woman gets married to this guy, that she, oh no, you were right, Dad. Mm -hmm. It's too late. Mm -hmm. Because the covenant has been made. Yeah. Watch how we handle God. When we start to handle God, that means we are so far out of left field. Let God handle us. Amen. Amen. You know, when we're doing those numbers, the significance of man and woman and marriage equaling family is, is glorious. That's right. You see, I may blow somebody's mind here, but here is the order. We have God first, God first, mm -hmm. yes. Aleph first. Yes. Morning, Gail. I got your email. But, okay. okay. Uh, second is wife or spouse, not the kids. church and ministry. But how many times do we have that reverse <laughs> like, I have to do this for God? Uh -huh. Well, we had to turn around backwards. Yeah. If the spouse is sick, well, I have to go to church. Mm -hmm. That's out of order, isn't it? If we were to take the simplicity of what God says, we would have so, so much less anxiety and so much less, oh, this Christian stuff is so hard, all this stuff. Christianity or believers are so simply received if we allow it to be. It's not hard. We make it hard. If you don't feel like coming to church one day, don't come to church. Thank you. You may have something wrong with you that you're going to give to somebody else anyway. If you don't want to tithe, I'm really going to get in trouble for this. <laughs> don't tithe. Why? You have to have a cheerful heart. Right. That's true. You're throwing your money down the tube, but, but the money's being used. God doesn't look at that. He looks at your heart. The lamp. Because if you love God, you want to give to Him. And if there's times where you just, yeah, when I was going to Bible school, we had people in there that, I don't have any money in the bank. 
but I'm going to write this check in faith. Well, that's hogwash, really. You don't write a check when you don't have money in there. God understands. But see, the church puts you under such condemnation that But that's not freedom. That's encumbrance. Thank you. Yep. Why I'm getting on this, I have no clue. Yeah, because there's something very spiritual in the room. Yep. Mm -hmm. Who is Israel's greatest enemy today? The greatest enemy? Yeah. You mean the Muslims, the uh, uh, Palestinians? Ishmael. Ishmael, yeah. Yeah. Born outside of right. marriage. Right. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So anyway, can we get back in here? Yes, ma'am. Can I say one thing? Yeah. I wish more ministers would get up in the pulpit and say what you just stated. People are under condemnation behind all this. I've got to give this. I've got to give that. They <coughs> don't have it. They don't even have food on the table. Yet they're giving to the church. God did not ask you to be here like that. That's right. He did not put that on you. You have somebody standing up in a pulpit who supposedly has a position of authority putting this on you. That's right. So That's right. if you will look to God and answer to Him and not that person standing up there, Amen. you'll be okay. Forget Him. Thank you. Talk out loud because you'll be picked up on that. One of the things that was in my mind when you first started talking about the tithing and, and <coughs> giving and not having a cheerful heart, at it. and sometimes uh, there has been times way in the past where I would just almost be, you know, out of breath listening to a pastor beg and in, and in some sense mm -hmm. and sometimes demanding. Yeah. A mm -hmm. certain amount of money, I mean, which had nothing to do with tithe. Yes. Thank you. And and I just got, even got disenchanted with what we call Christian television because they will Thank tell you, you put it on your credit card. And I'm like, what kind of God puts me in debt? That kind of money. That's right. Mm -hmm. And every one of them And the, I I put it like this: when you do something, <coughs> God God is not you begging. That's right. God did not tell you to beg and plead and say, well, if you do this, well, you're going to get this. Mm -hmm. Hey, where are you coming? Who told you that forever? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who gave you the authority to make that type of an assumption on someone else's life? You can't even make it on your own. Yeah. How can you make it on someone else's? Uh, Rebecca? I would just say, and I'm just, the word says that it's between us and the Lord. We will, stand before, we will stand before him yes. and make an account. Yes. So for the people on TV, I understand what you're saying. But the Lord says that we are to be holy as he is holy. Yes. We're to live a different life. And my challenge to believers is we need to come up to the next level. Yes, there's mm -hmm. a commandment for us to come together and mm -hmm. fellowship. That's mm -hmm. in the word. Yes, there's exact wording that we are to tithe. It's only 10%. Mm -hmm. That's between you and the Lord. Yeah, I won't make a conjecture on people on TV. That's their heart, not mine. I don't look to a man to lead me. I look to the Lord. Lord. As Thank you all you. Uh -huh. should be looking to the Lord. And exactly. even as I say to all believers, even now, if I can take it to the election, Lord Jesus, we need a man of some honor and integrity. Mm -hmm. As believers, we yeah. ought to be prayerful in everything we yeah. And who we choose. Right. There's this yes. thing called humanism where people are looking to the government to take care of them. Mm -hmm. And we've done that for a long period of time. Uh -huh. We've done it for eight years. We've seen where it's gotten us. And it, they yeah. chose poorly in Israel. They chose exceedingly poorly. We've seen the history. Today, as a nation, we need to search our hearts, go yes. to the Lord directly, and pray for the Lord to install the man of honor and not somebody who's just going to throw God off the pulpit. And there is a definite party that's thrown him out of their yeah, that will continue allegiance. To do so. so it's kind of like, take responsibility.
responsibility for your own actions. It's not the man on yeah, TV. Yeah, for real. It's not the man in the pulpit. It's between you and the and Lord. Right. And to whom you make decisions is between you and the Lord. Whether you tithe or not, it's in the Word. Yeah. Whether you show up to church, it's in the Word. Uh-huh. Period. If you will read your word, then you know your word, uh -huh. and don't depend on somebody else to tell yeah, you your word, then you can live as God wants you to live. You see why Hebrew is so interesting? <laughs> We're going off on these side <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Let's continue. If we take this word, yelled, and break it down with symbolic methods, this is what we're going to get. The Yud stands for the hand of God in Yaled, which is child. The Lamed is directing or teaching. That's what the Lamed stands for. And the Dalet is the door or Yeshua. Yeshua. Does not God want all of his children to come to him? It's all in the word yelling. So when we see a word, we can literally break it down as we continue going on with our lessons of uh, the Hebraic alphabet. We will find story after story after story that just is going to open up our hearts. But that's what, that's, that's the end result of yelling, God's hand directed to the door. In other words, as parents, we need to direct our kids to Yeshua, the door. Simple. In today's time, especially for me anyway, I need to see the vowels that were not written in the original text to know the meanings of the words. In the days of old, the readers of Torah, Tav, Vav, Resh, Hey, Torah knew the context of what they were reading and knew how to appropriate the word. But for guys like me, I need the vows. And here's a good reason why. Let's take a look at an example of what I mean. Since we're studying the letter Lamed, we will use some of the words with this letter. The word for bread is lechem. Word for bread. I'm going to say this. The second letter of the Aleph Bet is a bet. As we know, bet represents house. The word for house is bayit. The word for bread, as we're looking at, is lechem. Take bayit, lechem, house, bread, put them together, and you get Bethlehem. Where was Yeshua born? Bethlehem. Who is he? The bread of life. Hey. Hebrew. So now with lechem, if we break that word down, it's going to tell us a story again. So here we go. We know the story about the manna in the wilderness. The events that took place in the desert, 40 years, the Jews were to learn that daily bread is a gift from the Almighty. <coughs> Jews are biblically <coughs> required to say grace after every meal. I say mine before the meal, and I really should be saying it after. Why? Because I partook of the manna, and I'm thanking him for what he has provided. Most of us, including me, will say the prayer first. But that's really not the way it's supposed to be. But God's going to hear it anyway, no matter which way you pray Right? But it's fruit of thought. Wow. When do you say thank you, movie star, when you get a gift? You say after. After. After you 
receive it. I just popped into my little old brainy. You don't say thank you before Kenneth is going to give me a dollar or five or a fifty. of his mind. <laughs> you do it afterwards. Right. Isn't that right? That's true. Yes, sir. You know, you know the analogy of God being the Father for all of us? This morning I was listening to when the, the archangel came and told uh, Mary <laughs> you're going to be special as a mother. Uh -huh. God is going to send <laughs> Spirit named Jesus, <coughs> you said to give him birth. So, so uh, every one of us, God has to send the Spirit. <laughs> the Father sends the Spirit for each of us. Yeah. That's fatherhood beyond belief. Yes. And that's a gift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't work it. It's by grace that he gives it to us. Every What's the word for breath in Hebrew? What is it? Ruach. Ruach. Every ruach, every breath has been given to us for a price. And when we receive that ruach, that breath, he wants it back to honor him and to praise him, not to blaspheme him. The word lechem, lamed, chet, final mem sobit, has a value of 78. Now, here we go with numbers. The lamed is a 30. As we're studying, the chet, the chet is an eight. We've already studied the law, the, the chet. And the final men, which we have not studied yet, has a 40. So the sum is 78. Now, God, yud hey vav hey, totals 26. And someday when we teach again on the Talit, which is an eight-week teaching, we're going to find out a lot about number 26. But... Moving on, so when the Jews would pray in the morning, at noon, and evening time, that is three times. Three times 26 is 78. Yeshua is our bread, lechem, for bread of Chaim, life. And I need Let's go back to the vowel situation, the words. The word to, for to learn or to study is la mad, la mad. The word for te, the word for study is le med, le med. We're doing that right now, we're studying, le med. Studied, past tense, is la me. You see all the different vowel points? Yeah. The different vowel points are the same letters, but it's entirely different meanings. But the meanings are in the same contextual uh, gathering, but they all mean something a little different. Like knew and knew. I knew about you, but I bought you a new dress. Same, I spell a little differently, but same mm -hmm. sound. So that's why I need the vowels. Sages say that the Torah was the blueprint of the universe, and as the Midrash relates, God looked into the Torah and created the world meaning that he created it only as a medium for the performance of Torah's <coughs> commandments. Jeremiah 
says in 33.25, If not for my covenant, the Torah, day and night, I would not have established the laws of heaven and earth. So, was it not for the Torah, its study and observance, there would not have been a creation. God states that the universe without the Torah would be like a body without a soul or a cloud, a rain cloud without giving rain. Why is the Torah so important? Because it was a prelude for God having an instrument to tell about his creation. It's an instruction for us to lead us to God. That's the Torah. Mm -hmm. But we all know that. Not evolution. I'm sorry? And not evolution. Not evolution, no. <coughs> uh, if the planet is the body, the Torah is the soul. The purpose of creation was that there would be a species that was capable of making free will choices to recognize and obey God or to refuse to do so. That creature would be a man. He would be, he, if he made the right choices, he would be worthy of God's reward and bring creation to its preordained fruition. If not, the final redemption would be delayed the world would suffer, privatization and strife, and the violators would be punished. I would call the book of Genesis the pregnant book. That's where everything started. And I could also call the book of Revelation the ending book. They're really both one and the same, if you really study it. There are two kinds of sun and two kinds of darkness. I don't know if I spelled bear right. Was that is that the right? Please bear with me. Yeah, yeah. Is that the right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I followed with that for a minute. Is that, is that the right? It didn't sound right. It didn't look right. Barely there. There are hope. What's that? <laughs> it <is> barely there. <laughs> <laughs> There are holy places on earth, such as study halls. This is we, we're declaring this holy right now. With the lesson of Shiva. Sunday schools, churches, synagogues. Eretz Yisrael, land of Israel. And homes that are founded on the dictates of the word of God. The Am, I'm throwing in more Hebrew in here to get you acclimated to recognize some of the words. Am is people. Now, why did God make people? Because God is a jealous God. So the I, which we have not studied yet, represents I. I. The eyeball to see. The mem represents the word of God. Water. So God made people to see his word. Because God didn't make any junk. He made our eye to look upon purity, perfection. He gave us the right to choose what we are to look at. So with our perverseness, a lot of us have looked onto other than purity and perfection. And we have distorted the word of God because we have made ourselves above God when we do not obey God, if we think there is a God. I'm really getting off on tangents here, Kenneth, huh? <clears throat> they keep changing. They need to go away. You know why I think we're doing this? Times are getting short. Yeah. We cannot play around anymore. Thank you. We can't do church anymore. 
Now is the time that we've got this hurricane going in the south, but now is the time for us believers to hunker down. Mm -hmm. I've never felt that so strongly than, than now. I know Paul said it way back when, and mm -hmm. everything's been fulfilled. Israel's been created. We're ready to roll. And I'm really looking for the redemption as we look up. Our redemption draw nigh. We have to be so careful to live a life according to as close as we can to what God wants us to live. We can't play around anymore. We can't. Mm -hmm. And that includes forgiving people, mm -hmm. not being harsh with people, loving people. This is the ten days of all, come to think of it. This is where the Jews think that this is the time where God's door is open in all of heaven to receive whatever. Well, I don't believe that. I believe 365 days of the door is open. But this is a symbolism that if I've got aught against Rebecca or Gail, I have to make restitution. And then my midst vote is completed and I'm scored away to be in God's graces. At the last day of the tenth of all, you take a stone and you throw it in the water. And that represents a sin that has been thrown in the water. Now isn't this ironic? Believers, we call the rock, Yeshua. We call the body of water his word. Amen. Now, I'm not suggesting we're taking the shoe and throwing them in the water. But I am suggesting that as we encompass that stone, as the Jews are doing, that is our sin, but we are giving our sin to the word of God for forgiveness. Amen. Yes, sir. And in reference to getting close to end time, Isaiah made reference to a country like Russia, I think in 61. The Russians yesterday, there was a declaration they're moving atomic bombs into the Middle East. Right. Okay? Uh, they are going to be part of the process of almost the destruction yes. that's coming about. Right. And for that to be referenced in Isaiah, it is phenomenal how far back that was yeah. and up today. Yeah. Well, crucifixion wasn't discovered. I mean, it was talked about 700 years before it was ever discovered. Mm -hmm. So I think God knows what he's doing. <laughs> okay. okay, to continue. When the sun passes over such um, or people and places, God permits it to radiate spiritual blessings upon them. He opens the windows of his higher realm and lets the sun, Yeshua, shine upon his blessed ones. When it passes over Am, people, who are undeserving of blessings, it, is, it sets in the midst of the sky in the sense that its spiritual nature is blocked and it becomes merely a gaseous mass that provides planets with light, heat, energy, rotating endlessly as it carries its solar system through the cosmos. Astronomers have recorded reams of information about the sun, but they cannot see its spiritual nature. Just like a mortician, of which I was one, that performs autopsies that never had found a soul inside of it. He doesn't have eyes for it. Now, I was a mortician, and I never did see a soul. But I think I did a teaching one time where they did a weighing. They weighed somebody before he died, before he expired. Then he weighed them <coughs> after, the seconds after, and found 
that the body was less weight right after he died. And they say that you can actually weigh the soul. Now, I'm going way off course here, but scientifically, are you, you, you doctor? Huh? Are you still practicing? Absolutely. Are you, you sure you got your license? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and you're a, doc, you're a family doctor, right? Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes. So, family, so she knows, you, you may be able to attest to that, that there is a weight factor that's involved. You and I should have some conversations later. Okay. I finished the work that you failed in, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that was really raunchy. That I should have never said that. <laughs> and I certainly do not mean that. All right. Darkness, the psalmist writes in 104.20, you make darkness and it is night. The plain meaning of the verse seems obvious. God lowers the sun behind the horizon and night falls, shrouding the world in darkness. But the sages see a deeper meaning. The psalmist referred to this world, which is likened to the night. There are two kinds of darkness. Here we go. The first affects the eyes. The second affects the mind and the heart. Now, I can see, if I shut my eyes, I can see darkness. If I shut the light off, I see darkness. But with our spiritual eyes, we can see darkness in others. Can we see it in ourselves? How can we see darkness in ourselves? We just don't want to let it. Well, hold, hold it up before the Holy Ghost, you'll see it. There you go. <laughs> But we don't want to admit we have it. That's right. right. Why? Why? It scares us. It's pride. Yeah. Exactly. You know. Yeah. But it's, isn't it pride? I don't have this sin. You know, the log and the beam. But how else can you know when you're in darkness? Another believer will show you. Uh oh that's a rough one, Dale. There's no pun intended with darkness, because I'm dark. Because you're black? No. <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> but who wants to hear from another believer that you're in sin? There's where your maturity will shine. You either accept it, or reject it, and when you reject it, you know that the truth is coming at you. That's pride. That shows you that I'm not where I should be. And it will convict you. Then you go into another level of a maturity. What do you do after you are convicted? Do you make things right? Or do you continue to walk in pride. Repent. And walking in pride is like metal shavings nearing a magnet. Mm -hmm. It's just going to attach to you. Have you ever wondered how you can get the shavings off of a magnet? You demagnetize the magnet, and all of the shavings are gone. The Holy Spirit is our magnet that allows for the sin to drop after we confess our sins and repent to Shiva. The meaning is misery, destruction, death, ignorance, and disorder. And it is distinguished and separated from light and causes confusion and uncertainty. Now remember, we're discussing the Lamed, which means learning and teaching and direction. The, now the word in Hebrew used for the night is la -e la and describes a portion of the day between sunset and sunrise 
It also signifies the gloom or despair that sometimes engulfs the human heart from an absence of divine guidance. You know, there's two ways you can take the night. When you're in sorrow, the night is, depending on where you are, is a comfort or a deterrent to you. Other times, the night is refreshing because now you're looking forward to resting and falling asleep. But if you're in fear, nighttime is the worst place for you to be. Why? Because there's a lack of light. <coughs> <clears throat> and we can go into spiritual stuff there. What is light? Blindness of the mind and heart is worse because it can cause man to stumble and suffer injuries far more serious than skin needs. Blindness of judgment has caused all sorts of disasters throughout history. It has made Am people worship real and figurative idols. It has killed millions in needless wars. It has led on people away from God and convinced them that power and wisdom are theirs. It lets on rationalize and justify heinous wrongs. It caused Israel to lose two temples, be forced into crushing exiles, and deluded multitudes of Yeladim, Yeladim, children, that's a plural called Yeled, when you put the I, or when you put the, the Yud in the final memsal feet, that makes it plural. There's the Yudim, there's Yeled. Children into thinking that the Torah is open to change. On the first day of creation, God brought his light into existence, but the heavenly bodies had not yet been created. So that means what? We just read something something happened before something else happened huh? how can one of how can one avoid the darkness that deadens the mind and the heart how can one see the inner glory of the sun and the sun the great light that God created at the beginning of creation was the ore that's an olive a vav and a rash. now or that means light. As we look at that word, we see, first of all, the olive. The olive represents what? God, or number one. The second one, the second letter is a vav. The vav represents number six, or man, and it also represents Yeshua as man, does it not? Then the next one, the final one, is a resh, and what is resh? It means head. So that means the light coming from God through Yeshua to us, our head. That's light. Not a light bulb, but light from Yeshua. See how Hebrew is? Okay? All right, now we got that scored away. Light of Torah. Now, Yeshua is Torah. He is the living Torah. Okay. At first, that light was meant to be available to everyone, but God saw that few people were worthy of enjoying it, so he clothed it in the Torah. And why did he clothe it in the Torah? Because it was a gift. You had to go and you had to receive what God is offering you. He's offering you light. He's offering you Yeshua. But if you do not take the light, you're going to stay in darkness. Simple. All right. So there, whoop jumping around. So he pulled the Torah, and there it still remains. However, those of us that have seen the light, Yeshua, can see clearly. Why? Because the light has guided our path so that we do not go to the left nor to the right. We stay on the path, and we enjoy Chaim. We enjoy life. Because he is the light and the light of the world. I mean, The veil of blindness has been removed. Ever consider that the sun which provides light is so intense that it causes blindness? Whoa! Wait a minute. That's a reversal here. So if I'm looking at light, and if I see the light and I stare on it, it's going to cause me blindness. Too much light. Wow. 
The Torah was supposed to be light, the written word, but um, people could not and still cannot see the light of Torah, that they are, and they are still blinded. Until they experience the real light, the light of Yeshua. We're in the end times. We have to continue to bathe in the light so that we don't be led astray. Spiritual brilliance made the sun pale by comparison. We long for the day when we will see it again, but it is not gone. It is here. It is available. It awaits the diligent efforts of the righteous to discern it from between the lines and the letters and the bina, the wisdom of the Torah. Devarim 30, 11 through 14 says very clearly, For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of your reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross the sea for us and get it for us and make us hear it? that we may observe it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Anybody hear of the word shofar? I blow the shofar every Sunday. Shofar is written with a with, with a um, um, a sheen a fay and a rage, shofar, the word of God, the heart of God, I'm sorry, the heart of God is the, is the sheen, the heart of God. The faith represents the mouth. The rage represents the head or the earwig. So when the shofar is blown, it is presenting by your mouth the heart of God to the people. Hebrew. That's why it's a blessing when you hear the shofar being blown. It does something in here to you. You can't explain it, but there's something in there when you hear the shofar. Huh? Have you ever heard the shofar? Even though there is so much more information that can be presented on this, the tallest letter for now, we're going to put this aside and make room <coughs> for our next letter. Cousin, nice and loud. Aspire to inspire before you expire. And take what you need and give the rest away. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much for those on the internet and the Facebook and all this other gadgetry with uh, I Have No Clue. Uh, thank you for joining us and Shabbat Shalom. Until next time. Blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord, our great majesty. Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Till next time.